Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Christine Trost. I am the academic coordinator for the Berkeley Center for Right-Wing Studies. Ooh, thank you. <laughs> I'm also one of the conference organizers. And on behalf of everyone at the Center for Right-Wing Studies, I want to offer all of you a warm welcome um, this afternoon, and especially those of you who traveled far distances to be with us today. And there are many of you. When we began planning the conference last fall, our objective was to bring together young and established scholars who are engaged in research on the right, to share their expertise, to build knowledge, to strengthen existing networks, and to build new ones. We were also interested in knowing more about the range of projects that scholars are working on and, and what counts as right-wing studies. How do scholars situate themselves and their work in relationship to what we see as a growing field? What are the shared questions and areas of interest? What are the key debates? What theoretical frames and methodologies are they using? What are they finding? And what new insights emerge when this knowledge is shared, especially with people in other disciplines? The response that we received over 120 paper proposals was beyond our wildest dreams. And it really confirmed for us our hunch that not only is there a massive amount of work being done in this area, but an equally abundant desire to travel long distances on your own dime and share this knowledge and build on it through interdisciplinary dialogue and connection. So over the next two days, we will hear presentations by over 90 scholars from eight countries and four regions of the world, North America, Europe, Latin America, and also the Middle East. They will share new and emergent research, beginning with this panel, on the causes and consequences of growing far-right activism in different regions of the world, the construction of narrative, imagery, and pedagogies to advance right-wing efforts, the role of women, gender, and sexuality, as well as race, in right-wing ideology and movements, the use of the internet and social media to, to fuel far-right mobilization, the origins of America first, and the development of Trumpism, the transnational networks that fuel right-wing activism in Latin America and also Europe, and much, much more. In addition to today's keynote panel and 18 other panels, there will be a film screening and a discussion of documenting hate Charlottesville, and also time for informal discussion beginning with a catered reception immediately following this event, which we hope many of you will join us for. It's on the terrace, just one floor above us. The film screening is now full to capacity, along with several of the panel presentations, but there's still some room in others. So if you would like to attend the panel presentations on Friday and Saturday, please register online. It will let you know whether or not there's room still available in those panels. And information about how to do that is available in your program, along with the complete schedule of all of the presentations. We also hope to publish papers, many of the papers presented at this conference, and there's more information in your program about this as well. Before we begin, I would like to thank the other members of the conference organizing committee for their participation and hosting of today's conference. Um, and if they're in the room, they might be out helping, <laughs> but if they're here, please stand. Martina Avanza, I think she's outside. Alex DeBronco, Larry, also outside. Larry Rosenthal, right here. <laughs> Sherry Sollers, setting up the reception, um, and Craig Thomas. I also wish to thank our volunteers, Hamza Azmili, Kelly Jones, Riani Mariano, Hollis Potts, Lily Spira, Jakob Stachowski, and Carla Zamora. Finally, I would like to thank our many co-sponsors who provided funding or space or both and helped with publicizing the conference. The Institute for the Study of Societal Issues, 
the Center for Latin American Studies, Haas Institute for a Fair and Inclusive Society, Institute of European Studies, the Departments of History, of Sociology, of Gender and Women's Studies, the Townsend Center for the Humanities, the Scholar Strategy Network, and the Southern Poverty Law Center, which is the generous sponsor of our opening reception. If you would like to make a donation to the center, you can do so. Oh boy, it's really small. Um, hang on. <laughs> hang on. Oh, this is going to, right there, donate at, and there's a little um, <laughs> URL that you can go to. Uh, and now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Lawrence Rosenthal, who is the founder and chair of the Berkeley Center for Right-Wing Studies. Larry earned his PhD in sociology from UC Berkeley. He has studied the right uh, in the US and Italy especially, but in other parts of the world for more than four decades. Larry and I co-edited one of the first academic volumes to be published on the Tea Party, entitled Steep, The Precipitous Rise of the Tea Party. And Larry recently completed another edited volume on the new nationalism and the First World War with his co-editor, Vesna Roddick. He is currently finishing up a new book entitled From the Tea Party to the Alt-Right, Illiberalism Comes to America. In addition to his academic publications, he's he, his writing has appeared in The Nation, Foreign Policy, and many other venues, and he's frequently interviewed and quoted by national and international news outlets. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Lawrence Rosenthal. Well, thank you, Christine. I hardly recognize myself <laughs> from your description. Um, uh, Christine ran through a, a list of people to thank. There is one omission, and that omission is Christine. Um, without whom, none of this would happen. Um, and that is not an exaggeration. Um, I want to make some opening remarks, and then we'll get to the panel. Um, in, with apologies to Karl Marx, <laughs> I would like to open the conference with an observation. And the observation is this, that an oxymoron is haunting Europe. And also the Americas and lots of points beyond. And the oxymoron is the nationalist international. It is an interesting thing that in the 20th century, uh, unlike communism, which developed a communist international, and unlike socialism, which developed a socialist international, there was never a fascist international. I think there are a number of reasons for this, but one, I think, stands out from the rest. Nationalism based purely on the nation state breeds identities that necessarily come into conflict with similarly defined nationalisms. This is especially true when those nationalisms assert the superiority of, the, of one's own nation. So, for, you know, in short, it's hard to have comradely relations when one nation calls itself the master race and another the Mediterranean supermen. But today's populist version of populist nationalism has overcome this problem. How have they done that? They've done it because they share a common other. And in their othering, the nationalist international has found a uh, for itself a common identity. Let me quote the uh, British sociologist Janis Gabriel on identity formation and othering. Othering, Gabriel writes, is the process of casting a group or individual or an object into the role of the other, and, and this is the important part, establishing one's own identity through that opposition and frequently vilification of the other. The identity of these groups, in short, comes from identifying the other. 
the crucial, this is the crucial difference in identity formation that distinguishes the current populist nationalism from the nationalism of the interwar years of the 20th century. With a common other, you get a common identity. With a common identity, you have the makings of a nationalist international. The shared other of, of the nationalist international are immigrants and refugees, almost always dark-skinned, often of different religions, and largely hailing from the Middle East and Africa. In the USA, we have, there is a, a, nationalist, a, a nationalist specialization in refugees and immigrants from Latin America. The shared identity of the nationalist international goes by many names. How do they see themselves? What do they see themselves standing for? How do they characterize their identities? A very brief list would include, they think they stand for Western civilization or Western culture or European civilization. Uh, we have groups in America which call themselves, or a group which calls itself Identity Europa. And some people simply call themselves identitarians. Um, another, another category is to see themselves as representing Christian civilization. Another is representing traditional values. That point of view seems to specialize in having a particular animus for gays and feminists. And a final, perhaps most virulent category of identity is whiteness. We are the white people. We are the endangered white race. Today we have a cluster of, of players in the West who represent this point of view and have arrived in positions of state power. They are joined on the world stage by leaders and movements outside the West who have come to power with comparable nationalist and populist appeals. You know the names. Modi, Putin, Katinsky, Duterte, Farage, Salvini, Ergodin, Orban, Bolsonaro, Trump. And there are more. And there are near misses in places like France, the Netherlands, and others. Who do these nationalists see as their political opponents? The opposition are the multiculturalists and the feminists, who the nationalists often call cultural Marxists. Their opposition is sometimes characterized as the global liberal elite, whose power and in international organizations, like the European Union, are in the nationalists' crosshairs. The sense of international solidarity among these movements is plain. They meet frequently and appear to love being photographed together. <laughs> Steve Bannon, whose grasp of contemporary nationalism was key in putting Donald Trump in the White House, has been traveling in Europe acting as nothing short of an evangelist for the nationalist international. But above all, these, these groups are networked. The Nationalist International, like much of contemporary commerce of all kinds, is a creature of the age of the internet and social media. The transmission of ideas back and forth across the Atlantic has been particularly keen. The chant in Charlottesville that went so very deeply to the heart, or the core, of America's alt-right movement, that chant was, you will not replace us. Replacement theory is an import from right-wing thinkers in France who began talking about le grand remplacement decades ago. Meanwhile, in countries like Italy and Poland, we have activists marching in the name of whiteness, inconceivable in years past, but which is plainly an import from the USA. And that brings us to our conference today. Uh, in the coming days, we will concern ourselves with the right around the world, and we'll be privileged to hear 
and be joined by be joined by and hear perspectives and analyses from speakers for, from a wide variety of countries. As many of you know, the Berkeley Center for Right Wing Studies is unique. It is the only institution at a major research university devoted to studying the right. It has been our conviction that right wing studies is ripe to become a recognized academic discipline. Nothing has confirmed this more than the overwhelming response to our call for papers that Christine described to you earlier. I would personally like to thank all the speakers who have come to Berkeley, often from abroad, and to thank everyone here in the audience for your presence today and in the coming events in the conference. And with that, I'll conclude my remarks and move on, and thank you for your attention, and move on to um, uh, opening the conference with the keynote panel on the inaugural, of the inaugural conference on right-wing studies. This is the panel. Our panelists include, <laughs> um, where'd we go? <laughs> Heidi Byreich, um, who I'm looking for um, bios, excuse me. Uh, Heidi Byreich leads the Southern Poverty Law uh, Center's Intelligence Project which publishes the award-winning Intelligence Report and the Hate Watch blog. <laughs> Heidi is an expert at, on various forms of extremism, including white supremacists, nativist, and neo-Confederate movements, as well as racism in academia. She oversees the Southern Poverty Law Company, <laughs> SBLC's yearly count of the nation's hate and hardline anti-government groups and is a frequent contributor to SPLC's investigative reports and an often sought after speaker at conferences on extremism, which um, uh, this is one of them. <laughs> um, before joining the SPLC staff in 1999, Heidi Byrich earned a doctorate in political science from Purdue University. She's the co-editor and author of several chapters of Neo-Confederacy, a critical introduction published by the University of Texas Press in 2008. Um, we have next to me Ben Cowan. Ben got his... Wait till you hear me talk. <laughs> yeah, you know, it'll just be a louder applause. Uh, ben Cowan received his BA from Harvard and, a P and an MA and PhD from UCLA. His interest in right-wing radicalism, morality, sex sexuality, and 20th century imperialism has led him to research focused on, the, on Cold War Brazil with a specialization in the cultural and gender history of post-1964 era. Dr. Cowan's book, Securing Sex, Morality, and Repression, The Making of, the, of Cold War Brazil, was published in 2016. Um, he has also published articles in American Quarterly, the Journal of the History of Sexuality, the Hispanic Historical Review, Radical History Review, Latin America Research Review, and other venues. Alina Palyakova <laughs> is the David M. Rubenstein Fellow in the Foreign Policy Program, the Foreign Policy Program Center on the United States and Europe and Security and Strategy Team at the Brookings Institution, and also an, an adjunct professor of European Studies at the Nietzsche School of Advanced International Studies at Johns Hopkins. She specializes in Russian foreign policy, European populism, US-Russia-Europe relations, 
Her recent book, The Dark Side of European Integration, examines the rise of far-right political parties in Western and Eastern Europe. Uh, Alina Palyakov is a frequent uh, contributor to the Washington Post, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Foreign Affairs, Foreign Policy, and, and is a commentator in major media outlets, including Fox News, the BBC, and Bloomberg. And I would add, which is missing from her bio, that um, she was one of the very first fellows of the Center for Right-Wing Studies uh, here at UC Berkeley. Um, and we also have Joseph Lowndes, Boy, this, this, this panel is the people's choice. <laughs> Joseph, Joseph Lowndes is associate professor of political science at the University of Oregon. He researches and writes on race, populism, social movements, and parties in US politics. He is the author of From the New Deal to the New Right, Race and the Southern Origins of Modern Conservatism, and co-editor of Race and Political American Political Development. He is most recently the author uh, with Daniel Martinez Hosang of Producers, Parasites, Patriots, Race and the New Right Wing Politics of Precarity, which as he points out, is just out this week. Um, you know, <laughs> congratulations and be the first on your block. Uh, uh, I would also add that, that um, uh, Joe ha uh, was a, um, a contributor to the book we published uh, at, the, at the center, Steep, the Precipitous Rise of the Tea Party. He wrote a chapter called The Past and Present, the Past and Future of Race in the Tea Party Movement. Okay. Um, what we're going to do is, Heidi is going to talk about the issues of the right in the U.S. context. Joe Lowndes is going to give a kind of historical context for, for um, the, the current American situation. Alina is going to talk about uh, the state of the right in Europe. And uh, Ben is going to talk about the current situation in Brazil which um, is, is, has been widely reported on, as you know. Um, so each, each speaker is going to speak for uh, uh, you know, 12, 15 minutes. Um, after that, we will have a kind of discussion among ourselves, and then we will open the uh, floor for questions from the audience. Um, we're going to have Heidi and then... Uh, ben, and then Alina, and then Joe. So thank you all for your attention. Yeah. Um, thanks, Larry. Actually, Heidi and I made an executive decision here to switch our order, and so <laughs> the, the first moment of insurgency on this weekend of <laughs> conversations. May there be many more. <laughs> May there be many more. Um, so I, first I'd like to um, thank uh, Christine and Larry and Alex um, and other folks who helped put this conference together and are uh, working behind the scenes to pull this whole thing off smoothly. It's, um, it's huge to do something like this and an incredible amount of work that takes um, months and months of planning. And, um, and it's great to be back. I was here, as, as Larry said, uh, for about 10 years ago for, uh, to, when there was a, first a, a Tea Party book steep, and we didn't know at the time how steep it was going to get, how precipitous it was going to get, um, and so it's been quite a decade in between. Um, so Larry asked if I would uh, place the current situation in the U.S. in the context of the history of U.S. right-wing populism or extremism, uh, suggesting both the continuity and the novelty of, of where we are today, and I'm going to try to keep my comments kind of short, uh, partly because there's a lot of great uh, things to be said on this panel, and I know there's a, a lot of you who I recognize here in the audience who have, um, uh, who are experts in this stuff and have a lot to say. Um, 
the risk about talking about right-wing extremism solely in the context of the U.S., of course, is that it disconnects it from the ways that we're facing a global moment in the rise of the extreme right, as, as Larry pointed out. In the case of Europe and in European settler nations around the world, racial identity has come to the fore, rendered as biology, culture, religion, or all three, uh, to be self-consciously defended at the ballot box, in the streets, on the internet, and episodically in acts of gruesome terror. The far right in the United States is of a piece with this uh, uh, far right international, or um, as you call it, a national internationalism? Nationalist. Nationalist internationalism. Uh, indeed, increasingly so through channels and exchanges through which far right ideas, fantasies, conspiracies, and strategies and tactics are traded. But it's also a product of its own distinct histories. So in the US, let's begin with the obvious. Uh, the history of our present is grounded in settler colonialism, black slavery, Christian supremacy, imperial expansion, and heteropatriarchy. It is also grounded in long-standing American ideals of freedom, democracy, and self-rule. All these elements, uh, seemingly in contradiction, in co contradiction but often working uh, tightly together, uh, are resources for right-wing extremists and always have been as, they, uh, as these extremists envision the worlds they want to make. I think in recent years, we've seen the extreme right in the US go in two directions simultaneously, both to the margins and to the center of American political life. First, the margins. As Kathleen Ballou and others have uh, recently shown, and other people, Chip Burlett and others uh, here have uh, shown in the past, many white supremacist groups began taking a revolutionary anti-status path in the 70s and 80s, inspired partly by William Pierce's The Turner Diaries and shaped by military experience in Vietnam, among other things, elements of the extreme right abandoned the project of the American nation for a separatist white nation. This is the story of the Aryan nations, the order, Christian identity, uh, and associated armed separatist groups, uh, and actions including Timothy McVeigh's Oklahoma City, bomb, city bombing. The dream of a separate white nation took root more broadly among other far-right Klan and neo-Nazi activists and writers, and increasingly online. The belief that the U.S. would inevitably, inevitably become a majority-minority nation, particularly because of non-white immigration, drove the idea that the white race would have to seek refuge in a separate homeland. One of the most active areas targeted for an exclusionary white homeland is in the Pacific Northwest, where I live and work. This vision continues to flourish and inform far-right activity and exchange in both the U.S. and around the world among increasingly interconnected and increasingly dangerous far-right organizations and individuals. Another vision of the far-right, however, moved toward the center of U.S. politics in the 1990s in a way that was ultimately decisive for our present moment. The idea here was that the U.S. political system still offered the best avenue for far-right goals, as remote as that possibility seemed to those who thought that the U.S. had fully succumbed to leftist multiculturalism and to have been overrun by non-whites. Uh, this position was put forward perhaps most succinctly by uh, a man named Sam Francis. Francis was a diehard racist, paleoconservative intellectual, uh, an informal political advisor to Pat Buchanan's presidential campaigns. He began uh, his career as a Beltway insider, working first uh, for the Heritage Foundation and then uh, for uh, Republican Senator John East from North Carolina, before moving to uh, the Washington Times, where he was an editor uh, winning numerous awards for his uh, writing and editing there. He was uh, uh, ultimately uh, um, canned from his position in the Washington Times for overtly racist statements and went on to uh, edit and write for increasingly marginal far-right and racist publications. But um, Francis described himself as a populist defender of middle America and thought that the white majority could yet be rallied against corporate and state elites above and black dependents and criminals below and non-white immigrants from outside through electoral and constitutional means. As he put it in an article in the so-called race realist American Renaissance Journal in 1995, by embracing a strategy that involved the breaking up the United States, not only would whites be abandoning their own country, but they would also be forced to give up their appeals to its history, its traditions, and its interests as a nation. We could no longer cite the words of Jefferson and Lincoln and other American statesmen on racial matters. We could no longer invoke the U.S. Constitution as an authority. We could no longer argue that immigration threatens our national interests because there would be no nation to have interests. We could no longer mention the settlement and conquest of North America by whites, if only because we would have confessed that settlement and conquest have been failures from which we were now running 
as fast as we could. Francis had a point. As an historically white supremacist nation, there were and are rich traditions uh, of racism on which to draw from across the political spectrum. Right-wing populist insurgencies have episodically challenged Republican orthodoxy over the last half century. It was George Wallace and then Richard Nixon's ability to portray a majority of white working and middle class Americans as squeezed by elites above and black protesters, criminals, and welfare cheats below that drew significant numbers of voters out of the Democratic Party in the late 1960s and 1970s. This anti-blackness helped Republican candidates win elections over the next two decades. But right-wing populism had limited appeal uh, in the electorate in the 1990s, as anti-black politics had long since become the property of mainstream Republicans, and with the election of Bill Clinton, increasingly Democrats as well. Anti-immigrant racism became the key vehicle then for the far right's move to the center of U.S. politics, but it would take time, organization, and ideological development. It wasn't until Pat Buchanan's run in the Republican presidential primaries of 1992 that nativism was injected powerfully into GOP politics at the national level. Anti-immigrant politics had, across the 1980s, bubbled up on the far right, but it was Buchanan's campaign that framed, and popu framed it in populist language in a way that would allow it to cross back and forth between the white supremacist right, to whom he was connected, and the Republican Party, to whom he was also connected. We can think of figures like uh, David Duke, who were uh, consequential in this time period, both uh, uh, as a populist, as a uh, Klan leader, as someone who ran for office repeatedly in uh, Louisiana as a Republican, and someone who, uh, the, the person who began the first kind of white supremacist border, uh, border watches along the, the uh, southern border. To be sure, anti-immigrant populism depended on what scholar Natalia Molina has called racial scripts that transfer the perceived characteristics of one racialized subaltern group to others. But there were new elements as well. Specifically, Buchanan and those around him introduced nativism into the extant logic of right-wing populism in three ways. The first was the idea that immigrants were a direct threat to jobs and wages, allowing racist populists to talk about the rights of American workers. The idea of immigrants stealing jobs reinforced the producerist idea, going back to the anti-Chinese campaigns by white labor in the late 19th century, that elites used poor immigrants against the white working class. In the 1980s and 90s, this was a credible position insofar as much of the U.S. economic elite had a strong open borders position expressed from the campaign speeches of both Reagan and Bush to the editorial page of the Wall Street Journal. In the 1990s, it became yoked to a critique of globalism as well, a proposed free trade agreement such as NAFTA. Second was the emergent idea that the U.S. would become a majority-minority nation by 2050. This became a significant story in the news in the early 1990s, the cover of Time magazine, uh, Newsweek, etc., and one that the far right would use to talk about the end of white racial dominance in the U.S. This differed in distinct ways from anti-black populism, which figured African Americans as a parasitic class, but not one which would dominate American society in terms of numbers. Yet, like anti-blackness, it demonized women in particular as dependent, invasive, and dangerously fertile. Third, immigrants were depicted as outside invaders assaulting American culture, language, and institutions. As such, nativism brought the issue of nationalism to the center of right-wing populism in a way that it had not been present before. Domestically, it meant that the American nation had to defend itself and its borders from non-white others who would destroy it. Internationally, it meant isolationism and an embrace of nationalisms elsewhere. In some sense, just as nativism gained traction through its embedding in populist discourse, populism would require nativism to impact both the Republican Party and national politics more generally. This happened through a route that included the ideological intersection of racist right, paleoconservative, and eventually what came to be a post-paleo alt-right. The development of a harsh populist anti-immigrant movement that moved over two decades from California's prop, or from the Buchanan campaign through California's Prop 187 to Arizona's uh, Show Me Your Papers Law, SB 1070, and beyond, as these were taken up and uh, copied in other states. And also the parallel rise of the Tea Party movement following the twin events of the economic crash of 2008 and Obama's election that year. The pieces then were in place for a bright orange meteor to hit U.S. presidential elections in 2016. Two other interrelated parts of the story of the t past two, get, two decades are also central. The first was economic, the rise of the second Gilded Age, the greatest division of wealth between the very richest and everyone else in U.S. history, which did three things. 
First, it gutted the very basis of public provision, services, and guarantees built up over the middle decades of the 20th century. Second, among other things, this allowed whites to fall off the bottom in significant numbers for the first time. Whites were, in some sense, no longer indemnified or protected by their whiteness as they had been since the New Deal and thus open to new identifications. Third, the massive wealth, wealth gap produced new instabilities into the political system, particularly the party system, as was evident, I think, in both the Democratic and Republican uh, primaries in uh, the last election cycle. The second part of the story, directly related to the first, is the steady erosion uh, of the accountability and credibility of U.S. political institutions, uh, including the Congress, the courts, and the media. In 2016, Donald Trump staked his presidential campaign first and foremost on a pungent racist nativism. The virulence of this language was as shocking as his electoral success was to many scholars, journalists, and even elites in his own party. He portrayed, as you know, Mexican immigrants as drug smugglers and rapists, called for mass deportations, promised a wall along the southern border, and proposed a, uh, a temporary ban on Muslim immigration. I don't need to rehearse the far-right elements of Trump's presidency, the cast of racist and authoritarian figures in the White House, Trump's own egregious corruption and Caesarism, now taken for granted by large swaths of the public, the publicly staged sadism at the southern border, the increased militarization of ICE. I could go on, and I'm sure so could all of you. Perhaps the most consequential has been what looks like the complete capture of one of the two major political parties by the far-right. The GOP has now committed itself fully to Trump's agenda. Party leaders who once opposed Trump have long since decided it isn't wise to do so, given the national electoral portrait of the party, as long as Trump continues to deliver on the upward transfer of wealth, as he did with last year's tax reform. Republican fortunes, therefore, will now re rely on doubling down on voter suppression of people of color, treating undocumented people and asylum seekers as sacrificial lambs, and appealing directly to white political identity. This electoral path will be greatly eased if the Supreme Court decides to let the Trump administration ask about citizenship on the next census, ensuring severe undercounts in high immigrant areas, which in turn will decide state and national vote appor apportionments. In short, the far right has and will likely continue to shape general, the general contours of U.S. politics in ways that will have grave consequences. It appears then that Sam Francis might have been right after all. The far right's most effective strategy over time would be to go straight up the middle. But this inside strategy is also continually depended on far-right groups outside the system, if parallel to it. Think, for instance, of the border militias holding migrants at gunpoint last week, or of uh, uh, militia groups working with police, as we saw repeatedly uh, in Portland, Oregon, or as uh, journalist Jason Wilson out there uh, uh, revealed last week, Republican legislators like Matt Shea in, in Washington uh, texting back and forth with, uh, with far-right groups with kind of uh, sadistic ideas about what they would like to do with Antifa. Uh, and perhaps a more striking development uh, in Dan Hosang's in my new book, and as you'll hear about from Chloe Cooper, I think, on Saturday, uh, there are ways in which the right-wing formations have tried to extend their reach by recruiting people of color now uh, into, into these groups by incorporating themes of multiculturalism and emphasizing violent masculinity over race. In any case, we should be prepared to be dealing with a powerful far right uh, in many forms in years to come. Thank you. Well, is this on? On? Can you guys hear me? Yes. I thought my job was depressing, but you just put like 25 years of depression into, you know, three pages of information. <laughs> well, I, I just, before I start, I want to thank Christine and Larry and the center for, you know, having me here and letting us be involved in this conference. I think the work being done here is critically important for all the reasons you just laid out in the U.S. context, and I know we'll hear from many others um, from around the world. Uh, so, I, you know, I'm, I'm a former academic and, and now an activist that has been working since 1999 and failing at trying to counter uh, the rise in this kind of thinking, racism, extremism, and so on, and all the forces that you just uh, described. And I think it's interesting that you brought up Sam Francis because he certainly did have this idea in mind uh, back in the early 90s when people like he and Jared Taylor still had sort of a foothold in the... Um, in the mainstream. So since this, you've already heard such a good uh, description of the history of how we got here, 
I thought I'd talk a little bit about the kind of data that the Southern Poverty Law Center collects and what we're seeing in terms of numbers um, of people and organizations involved uh, in building this movement, which I would argue is now an international movement. It's not actually looking at it from a nationalist, like a national frame doesn't make any sense anymore. So we, we've been counting hate groups, which are basically organizations that demonize an entire other group of people based on inherent characteristics. So, you know, typical things are neo-Nazis, Klansmen, but also these more suit and tie uh, racists like Sam Francis, they, you know, tend to call themselves white nationalists or the alt-right today. We've been counting them for about 30 years. And the number of those groups in the 1990s was relatively steady. And, and then in 2000, when the Census Bureau said that whites would def definitively be a minority in 2042, the number of those groups immediately began to climb, and they shifted their uh, entire kind of ideological take to an anti-immigrant position. Uh, it was no longer about, you know, African Americans being parasites or, you know, leeching off the system. Um, people involved in white identity politics knew very well uh, that immigrants were the threat to their sort of racial control of Western societies. And so David Duke went from hating black people to hating immigrants, you know, almost overnight. The number of those groups has essentially doubled in the last almost 20 years. But, you know, counting, there were 1,020, we, we counted in, in uh, 2018, um, and that's the highest we've ever counted. But, but that is a number that greatly undercounts the problem that we really have in the United States in the era of the web, right? It's, it's one data point, but it, it doesn't really grasp what we're, really, what we're talking about here. Um, because the internet has been, uh, when it comes to white supremacy, anti-immigrant views, anti-LGBTQ, anti-Muslim, and all these things, because the web, at least until Charlottesville, was it a basically unregulated space? Uh, there have been, you know, millions of people who have been exposed to content that you could not get your hands on, propaganda that you could not see in the 1990s. Uh, you know, if, if you think about it, in the 1990s, if I wanted to read, you know, if I wanted to learn about how the Jews are taking over the world, I had to find somebody who could kind of inculcate me into that thinking. A librarian wasn't going to point me directly at the protocols of the elders of Zion with, without an explanation, right? They would be, you know, telling me this is a piece of propaganda and, and whatnot. And because radio and television were regulated, radio in particular because Hitler used it to fuel his rise uh, before the war, before World War II, there, there wasn't a space for this kind of propaganda. But then there came the web... And that changed the, the dynamics completely. And it's not just that propaganda was available and could be spread with an ease that didn't exist before. The web is also a two-way means of communication or a group communication. So you can radicalize people into movements. You can talk to them about these ideas and you can convince them of their veracity in a way that isn't possible with one-way communication. Of course, you know, ISIS and Al-Qaeda know this as well and have tried to use it that way. But in the case of that propaganda, the tech world has been much more serious about removing it. Un until the Charlottesville uh, rallies, the tech world, places like Facebook and Twitter, Twitter maybe still, um, and other big platforms, were essentially argued that there was no reason to look at content that was white supremacist because the United States has a First Amendment and good speech will crowd out bad speech. Uh, when Heather Heyer was killed, and we saw people marching in Charlottesville who looked like Klansmen from the 1920s saying, the Jews will not replace us, there was an awakening in, um, in Silicon Valley, and the rules began to change. However, that meant we had a couple decades in which young white men, both in the United States and abroad, were radicalized into ideas that lead to things like the mosque, uh, you know, the mosque attacks in New Zealand not too long ago. We don't really actually know how big the damage actually is that the, when this material was proliferated everywhere, spread everywhere, 
and easily um, shared. So I'll just give you some ideas of the kinds of numbers that we're talking about here. Uh, you know, there's the oldest hate site on the web is called stormfront.org. It had 180,000 registered members when Obama came into office. It had about 335, 340,000 when he left office. The Daily Stormer, which is a really gross neo-Nazi website that has been connected to multiple domestic terrorist events, including the Dylan Roof shooting in Charleston, the, um, the assassination of the MP Joe Cox, who was an advocate for refugees in England, uh, a man who went, Thomas Jackson, who went to New York City to kill black people with a machete, and we were lucky he only killed one person. That website, which was founded in 2013 and, and clung on to um, Donald Trump in his rise, called him the glorious leader, at this point in time has over 4 million unique readers a month. So uh, it's, these numbers are really, really big. And, and I could point to other sites. The, there's a website called Gab, um, which is a forum for people who got kicked off Twitter, basically, after Charlottesville, that has about 800,000 registered users, and it's a sewer pit of, um, of propaganda. And I could go on like this. There's the Russian social media service VK, uh, which is filled with neo-Nazis and uh, essentially an unregulated space. Uh, and there's the continuing problem of this propaganda on Facebook. The immigrants that you were talking about being detained by the militias last week actually Facebook lived their kidnapping of these people. Mm. So it's, in, and the, the shooter in um, New Zealand did the same with um, his shooting. He made it look like a live action uh, game. So it's not as though the mainstream platforms um, have fully reformed, but you know they're getting better. But we still have this propaganda popping up all over the place, and um, you know not adequate strategies uh, to remove this. And we also have technology being used by people like Donald Trump and others who want to race bait or bash immigrants or Muslims, whatever the case may be, available to political figures who have followed in Trump's footsteps, you know, once you win um, the presidency by uh, this demonization strategy, other people pick it up and decide to use it themselves. Uh, in this last election cycle, the, the 2018 vote, we collected information which we didn't disclose because we're a 501c3 and we can't electioneer, but we found about 300 candidates at both the federal, state, and the local level, most of them at the federal and the state level, who were essentially clones of Donald Trump running for office. So this, the electoral strategy that Donald Trump showed the GOP can work now by running off of racism is spreading out to further and further um, candidates. So that's another dimension of the problem that we're looking at. So we have hate groups. We have really bad situation with online propaganda. We have people running for office on hate platforms. We ha also have a situation where there is a developing consciousness across borders that white people are sort of all in this together. And so what, you know, these kinds of movements used to be very, white racialist movements, very particular to various countries, that doesn't really exist anymore. Um, you know, the web obviously has made it easy for people to interact across borders, but they've also all sort of settled on a particular ideology which is that white genocide is happening uh, because of immigration and, or the great replacement, however you want to put it, and that something has to be done to stop that from happening. And we're seeing versions of this talk coming from the highest levels in office. Donald Trump spoke um, at one point. He asked the State Department when Pompeo was there to investiga investigate a genocide of South African farmers, which is the canary in the coal mine of the white genocide myth um, that exists in white, white supremacist circles. So there's a cohesive ideology, a connected network that shares financial resources, communicates, propagandizes, and there's a domestic terrorism problem, really domestic and international now, uh, that we didn't really have 10 years ago. I mean, it's not like white supremacists didn't kill people in prior eras, and Timothy McVeigh patterned the Oklahoma City bombing on the Turner Diaries, which is a race war novel. 
but we didn't have the rapidity of the incidents that we're having now. In fact, in 2018, um, as the Anti-Defamation League counted, there was basically nobody killed by an Islamic extremist in the United States. All the attacks were committed by white supremacists, and you'll probably remember there were four of them, actually, just at the time of the elections. Cesar Sayoc, the, the failed pipe bomber, a man who killed two African Americans in Kentucky and who was a racist, uh, the horrible shooting at the synagogue in Pittsburgh by a man who believes Jews are behind a plan to import refugees and immigrants into the United States to undermine whites, and then a shooting at a yoga studio in Tallahassee of two women by a man who was deeply misogynistic. And I'll, I'll just finish to say one last thing about the ideological makeup of white supremacy today, which I think makes it much more virulent and much scarier, is, you know, when I first started tracking white supremacists and hung out with members of, like, the neo-Nazi National Alliance, women were certainly not viewed as equals in these groups, but they were considered to be, you know, they kind of put them on a pedestal, like a, you know, a, a very um, kind of a demeaning pedestal. But they were the women, the Aryan motherhood concept, they were the women of your Aryan children, and they were something to be prized. This movement today, especially younger racists, kind of millennial racists, is misogynistic beyond belief. A lot of the leaders of this movement came up through 4chan and 8chan and Gamergate, and they have, they have injected misogyny concepts such as legitimate rape, um, the right to beat you know, women. I mean, the descriptions of women are horrific, sluts, and I could you know, use uglier words. They've injected misogyny into this movement, which is an, an additionally virulent aspect to what is happening, hence the um, man who drove his van down the streets of Toronto uh, targeting women, and also the Elliot Roger killings at UC Santa Barbara a few years ago. So we have a, we have a terrorism kind of hierarchy or dimension that includes attacking women, people of color, Muslims, Jews, I mean, they've essentially made um, white supremacists now have come to view basically everything but white males as a possible target um, of violence. And the number of these attacks is ratcheting up, and it's also internationally connected. So Tarrant, the shooter in New Zealand, was friends with identitarians in Austria and France and connected to American white supremacists. So now... This movement is looking a little bit more like other international terrorist movements and a little less like something domestically contained. So my last thought about this, this problem. There are hopes that perhaps the web can get control of this white supremacy proliferating there. Remains to be seen. It's been quite the struggle. But we already have millions of people who've been radicalized into these ideas over the last you know, decade and a half. Um, our big worry at the Southern Poverty Law Center is what happens in the lead up to this next election, especially if Donald Trump loses. We will then have a radicalized uh, white supremacist movement that will be extremely frustrated and think politics is controlled now by some kind of multicultural, Jewish-led, international, global elite thing, and, they, and there's no political pathway anymore to their ideas. We'll also have an anti-government movement that has come to see Donald Trump as the only person in government they've ever loved. And if he goes down, we might see domestic terrorism from, from there. And we haven't taken this threat seriously at the international level or even the domestic level for decades, basically, basically since the late 1990s. So that kind of an explosion is going to be very, very hard uh, to counter when it comes. And so that's what we're concerned about at SPLC. Thank you. Um, all right. Let's see here. I do have some pictures because without them I'm nothing. I do have some pictures because without them I'm nothing. Um, let's see here. Uh, no. Uh, there we go. Um, so, uh, Christine mentioned that, sh that this conference was designed to bring together 
young and also established scholars, and I'm going to have to presume that I'm in the young category, <laughs> because I certainly don't feel uh, established, especially in this august company. Um, thank you so much to my fellow panelists, um, to all of you for you know coming to listen um, today, and especially to Christine and everyone who worked so hard to put this together. Um, I can't imagine the amount of work that went into this, um, and I'm just so pleased to be a part of it. It's really an honor. Um, so um, if you'll permit me, um, I'll, I'd like to begin in the present, sort of, even though I am a historian, as you will quite clearly see. Um, on the left here, we're looking at um, an excerpt from a sort of a typical excursus of Olavo de Carvalho, um, which was republished yet again in 2018. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with Carvalho, um, he's a Brazilian who has been called Jair Bolsonaro's ideologue or Bolsonaro's guru. Um, and he's among the most well-referenced uh, thinkers, and I do use that term somewhat loosely, um, of the current right-wing political and cultural moment in Brazil. Um, there are lots of things that we could say about him, but um, among other achievements, he's credited with popularizing uh, the term gaitsismo, um, which seeks to essentialize an argument that gay rights movements are in fact part of a worldwide plot that combines homosexual hegemony fascism, and, wait for it, communism. Um, so, you know, uh, you know, there's a lot in this passage which I won't read, but I want to draw attention to two things here, right? Um, first, that he references presumptively a, quote, long historical partnership between homosexualist ideology and Nazism. And second, that Carvalho, who is himself a Brazilian Catholic, if somewhat lapsed, um, he validates that link, right, based on his reading of the work of Scott Lively, um, who is an evangelical from the United States, infamous for attempts to build um, a sort of international gay, uh, anti-gay infrastructure, I should say. Now, um, I mean, if gay fascism were a thing, <laughs> clearly I would sign up, right? I mean, for the uniforms alone. But, um, uh, uh, sadly... I think we can all agree that that idea is pretty ahistorical. Um, but it is definitely part of, what, part of what is represented here, right? Part of what we're seeing in this column and later the book that was published um, is the argument that gay rights and indeed gay identity is part of this much broader agenda, a sort of a, an authoritarian, fascist, communist, um, humanist, and anti-Western plot that includes marginalizing anyone who is not gay, right? Um, now, if that sounds somewhat familiar, um, perhaps it's because of Brazilian President Jair Bolsonaro's famous popularization of the term heterophobia, right, heterophobia. Um, it also might be because of, of course, the decades-long invocation of the boogeyman of the gay agenda, um, something reflected in the bedrock of the new right in the United States, including, obviously, Scott Lively. Um, but that notion of the gay agenda, of course, dates back much further than that, right? Um, at least to the pioneering work of Enrique Rueda, um, whose book you see here. Um, he wrote this in 1982 as part of an effort to build homophobia into the center of this then emergent platform linking sexual moralism, religious and cultural traditionalism, anti-communism, and of course, opposition to the welfare state. And Rueda's book was specifically about the United States, right? But it was written as part, specifically as part of a playbook for transnational right-wing organizing. So to get back to the, um, int the nationalist international, right? Certainly, this was, he's one of the pioneers of that um, notion in its current iteration. Um, Rueda was one of the principal collaborators of Paul Weyrich, who many of you will know um, from the role that he played in the sort of foundations of the new right in the United States. And of course, you know, this kind of homophobia is part of a much broader set of ideas about morality, right, which are in turn part of an even broader set of ideas um, and of similarities in terms of the politics of the right in Brazil, in the U.S., and elsewhere. So in some sense, what I want to just kind of spotlight rather rapidly today is the line linking Brazil and the United States across these decades, right, 1982, 2002, and then today. Um, in some sense, what I want to talk about is the backstory, right, of how we get to the nationalist international, how we get to where we are now, which is this kind of, you know, vertiginous and surreal conjuncture in which the Olavo de Carvalho's and the Steve Bannon's and the Bolsonaro's and the Donald Trump's of the world stand together as representatives of our current configuration of 
moralistic, hypercapitalist, and identitarian conservative politics. Now, um, as I think is apparent to most of us, right, that's a politics that is ridden with contributions, but which is currently portraying itself as not only inherently coherent, but also revolutionary. And the basic point is this, right? That this, this kind of sort of love fest between Bannon and Carvalho and Trump and Bolsonaro and everything that that represents, although it may continue to shock and outrage many of us, it is of course not exactly new, right? It comes out of a long history of collaboration and planning on the right, um, the coalescence of what we now call you know, the new right via cooperation that transcended religious denominations and also national borders, and cooperation that certainly predated the internet and the sort of the most visible ways that we see that cooperation <coughs> happening right now. I mean, these days, you know, we sort of presume the coherence of a Christian and neoconservative right that unites anti-modern social, religious, and cultural reaction with renovated and sometimes radical doctrines of deregulation and this triumphalist self-reliance and laissez-faire capitalism. In other words, a so-called new right, which you know, has outlived the modifier, right? The new right is obviously not, it's not new, right? It's old and it's venerable, and now in perhaps yet another stage of transition. So on the one hand, the idea of the United States um, uh, which my colleagues have so brilliantly just discussed for us, um, the idea of the United States as an epicenter both of neoliberalism itself and of kind of Christian neoconservatism as a comrade in arms, that idea is broadly diffused. But lesser known are longer and broader histories of these phenomena and other places and actors that concurrently and collaboratively developed their own renovated conservatisms. And I want to suggest that, you know, beginning in the 1960s, Brazil and its Christian conservatives played a fundamental role in developing a transnational Christian right, one which could encompass and bind together anti-communism, opposition to welfare, cultural traditionalism and reactionary moralism, anti-modernism, which was sort of tinged with modern media savvy, um, and opposition to social justice movements, from liberation theology to black rights and feminism. So it's not that the new right emerges in the United States under the guidance of people like Weyrich and Ruela in the 1970s and 1980s and then gets exported to places like Brazil. Rather, Brazil and specific Brazilian actors formed another critical locus of a transnational series of movements aimed at generating renovated, reactionary, outraged, and mobilized conservatisms. So what I want to suggest is that sort of how we get to the Bolsonaro-Trump axis, right, has a lot to do with, the Brazil, with Brazil and the United States as critical foci in the creation of that right or that series of related rights which have transcended national borders and national identities. So in broad terms, I think we need to interrogate not only how we got to Olavo de Carvalho as philosopher-in-chief, right, but why Brazil and the United States and other places have this sort of eerily similar configurations of left versus right. Um, I mean, we might think here to play sort of fast and loose of a widely conceived battle between moralism and security and policing and anti-statism on the right, and then pluralism and opposition to policing and support for various forms of state planning on the left. But more elaborately, um, we might think about a platform for the right that looks roughly like this in both Brazil and the United States. And the reason that we can draw out these kind of rough schematics, or we can think about um, a national and nationalist international, that is hard to say. There, we've got to come up with a better. Uh, the nationalist international, um, the reason that we can, what's that? Oh, well, thanks. Um, so the reason we can talk about this, right, is that the new right, in fact, arose transnationally, right, in circuits that transcended borders and were peopled by activists who trotted the globe and did so quite deliberately. Um, Brazilian activists participated actively and very effectively in those circuits and forums in shifting and overlapping ways that ranged from um, these men whom you see here who pioneered global Catholic traditionalism, um, but also ranged to you know, opposing social justice and civil rights movements in Brazil and elsewhere, and supporting authoritarian anti-communism, certainly across the American hemisphere. Now, um, I'm not going to go into detail about all these networks, but these are you know, some key organizations, Brazil as, Brazilian as well as North American, who forged links to promote new forms of conservatism in the 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s. Um, and these come from my own research as well as that of other scholars here and in Brazil. Um, 
these organizations and the individuals who made them function transcended considerable differences of denomination and doctrine and national identity and culture. And obviously, you know, we could go on and on here, right? But my point is that these groups and their leaders demonstrate a really important story of enthusiastic cross-border cooperation between elite reactionaries of various religious stripes in Brazil, the United States, and further afield. And long before, they had the sort of facile networks that they might have had today in the age of, you know, of 4chan and the internet, et cetera. Um, and these things explain, at least in part, why these two countries, right, why Brazil and the United States have become, you know, epicenters or power centers of a right whose tenets are maybe best summed up by the moniker given them in Brazil's national debates, which is bala biblia boy, which means um, Bibles, bullets, and beef. Um, how much time do I have left, by the way? Oh. Sorry? <laughs> this is true. Uh, so, five minutes. Oh, great. Okay. So, I want to sort of take us in a different direction with maybe a slight provocation, right? Um, I mean, first of all, I'm really excited to hear from those of you who work on other parts of the world beyond Brazil, but also, of course, beyond Latin America, um, about how you do or don't see these kinds of organizations and networks and connections um, at the base of manifestations of these kind of eerily similar conservatisms. Um, but... I also want to make a case for Brazilian exceptionalism, of course. <laughs> um, my sense is that um, this kind of resonance that I've been signaling with these, these images, right, um, this resonance between Brazil and the United States is part of a special sort of relationship, um, but also part of a, an often neglected story of Brazil's importance in what is a broader global story. Um, and this is true for a lot of reasons, right? Uh, because of Brazil's and Brazilians' role in the development of global Catholic traditionalism, um, because of the survival of fascism in Brazil after World War II, um, because of the rise of Brazil as an epicenter, maybe the new epicenter of global evangelical Christianity after 1970, um, because of the interconnected histories of anti-communism and anti-Semitism and moralism in Brazil, because Brazil has a now newly legitimized monarchist movement, um, among many other vectors. So the resonance of the, the, you know, the Bible bullets and beef, right, the BBB as it's called, um, with the politics of the so-called you know, red state conservatism in the United States, I mean, it has its hiccups, right? I mean, race would be a major one that I think we will need to address. Um, but you know, the reason that Steve Bannon is so easily translatable into Brazilian politics, you know, so much so that he was hired by Bolsonaro's campaign, I mean, that derives from a special role that Brazil played in various arenas of 20th century conservatism. And when I, so part of what I mean is like when I see this dynamic between Trump and Bolsonaro, right, when Bolsonaro visited the White House, you know, Trump is completely ignorant of Bolsonaro and of Brazil's politics, right? Um, but sort of like, you know, pleasantly surprised to find this assiduous ally, right? I mean, Bolsonaro famously calls Trump his idol, right? And Trump is like, oh, oh, cool, okay. Um, so, you know, when I see that dynamic, I think immediately of North American conservatives activists who went to Brazil in the Cold War and were similarly shocked um, and pleased, right, to find like-minded allies already working and doing the sort of the groundwork of building transnational conservatism, which in many ways outdid the efforts of those North American activists in terms of extremism. Um, so, uh, I mentioned Paul Weyrich before, and I'll just close with this quote from him, which is one of my, um, I mean, favorites isn't the word, right, but it's, it's one that I recur to often, right, um, he's, in this moment, you know, he's founded the Heritage Foundation, is trying to expand internationally, and he goes to Brazil and discovers this group, Tradition, Family, and Property, or TFP, um, and he makes this speech to them in 1988, um, and, you know, to be fair, this is a group which had anticipated Weyrich, right, in his desire to create a transnational umbrella of reactionary Christian societies. But that's part of why, right, when he's sort of addressing them in Sao Paulo, right, he says, you know, that it's such a great privilege to be there and that the conversations he's had with their leader have been the most extraordinary of his entire political life, right, um, and that the TFP is one of the few trustworthy and truly coherent organizations with which we can associate, right. Um, so that's my case for Brazilian exceptionalism, which I intend to be something of a provocation, and I would like to generate conversation about how these networks have led us to where we are now, right, in terms of a much broader vision of a, a new right platform that is no longer new. Thanks. Thanks.
Um, so I guess I have the uh, the honor of, of going last on this panel, and I also feel in some ways that what I work on now is kind of uh, soft and fuzzy in comparison to um, especially uh, what you laid out in such stark detail, um, Heidi. So before I start, I just want to, you know, second, third, or fourth, um, all of my fellow panelists and thinking the Center for Right-Wing Studies and Larry and Christine especially, um, it's really just such an honor to be here again after being, yes, one of the first uh, fellows in the program and um, the, really having a home here as a result of the center uh, while I was doing my graduate work. So, so thank you so much for that and for inviting me to come back. Um, so I don't work on this issue from an academic perspective as much anymore. Um, I work much more on policy issues in Washington and Brookings. And so I kind of come at this from a slightly different view as a result and, but I think so far, you know, Larry, uh, you were encouraging us to, to think about uh, a conversation amongst ourselves. And one thing that I've been hearing very clearly from my colleagues uh, who work on uh, parts of this issue that I don't tend to look at is that um, this is kind of an old new phenomenon in some ways. Um, and then the, in, in this, these patterns and historical trends have been ongoing um, in various dynamics across the globe, we just haven't really been paying attention. And now we sort of find ourselves in this space where it almost seems like a huge upsurge and a shock of either the subcultural movements, the neo-Nazi white supremacist movements, or these movements at the, at the political level as well. And I think certainly uh, when I talk about these issues to a more general audience, that is the impression that all of a sudden we've had this explosion of global populism or nationalism, when in reality there's been a slow simmering trend um, that we are now just starting to pay attention to for a variety of reasons. And I think you know, switching to what I work on, which is the European context, that's certainly absolutely true in, in Europe. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of attention now being paid to uh, whether the not, it be the National Front in France or the League in Italy, which you talked about a little bit, Larry, as well, or the alternative for, for Germany in, in Germany, um, and the kinds of gains that these political parties are making in national politics and also at the European level. Um, but certainly none of these political ideas, and certainly not some of these political parties, are new. Uh, you know, the FPU, which is the Freedom Party in Austria, is a junior coalition partner um, in the government right now with the center-right party, it was founded in the 1950s. And the National Front uh, in France has existed since the 1970s. So now we've had decades of this you know, steady, slow burn rather than a, a sudden explosion. And actually, if you look at, at the kind of electoral results these parties have achieved over time, um, it really looks like a, just a very slow increase if you look at the European average. Um, but I think certainly um, in recent years we've seen, um, you could say, an emergence of these political parties in a greater and greater number of European countries versus them being sort of confined to a core. Um, but I think it's become clear that in the academic literature we thought of these political movements in the 1980s, when we start, first started paying a little bit of attention, it was like five of us working on it. Um, <laughs> and, you know, back in the day, not in the 80s, I started working in the early 2000s. Um, but there was a general agreement that these were single issue parties um, that were going to fade away as soon as the mainstream parties kind of picked up whatever issue they were concerned with. And again, the anti immigration frame that we now sort of take for granted as a key characteristics of these groups was not there at the very beginning. Um, these parties um, initially were actually neoliberal parties. They were right in terms of the economic policy and authoritarian. And that was something that we called the winning formula in the 1990s in Europe. Um, this combination of authoritarian ideology and kind of neoliberal right uh, economic um, ideas. And so then suddenly this, this winning formula starts to flip. And it starts to flip um, even before we have the refugee crisis in Europe, certainly, I mean, before we have the financial crisis in 2008 in Europe as well. And now the, the frame has very much become you know, anti-establishment, anti-immigrant, and that manifests itself in, in various ways across the spectrum. So I think the, there's a couple of points I just want to make, and I'll try to keep my comments short because I'm really keen to get to our interactive conversation. Um, the fact is that we find ourselves in this new reality in Europe. 
uh, that these you know, far-right nationalist populist groups will continue to have a presence in European politics, I think, for the foreseeable future. And so the question is, uh, some of my colleagues may answer from their particular views as well, you know, how do we get to this new reality? What have been the drivers of these political movements, not just across one country in Europe, but across the entire European spectrum? Um, I will just preface this to say that these drivers really vary on a case-by-case -case basis, but there are some commonalities that we can speak to that happen across the economic, political, and cultural uh, spe uh, spectrums. Um, so on the economic side, you know, I think there's a common, uh, say, misperception that it is during economic downturns uh, when people experience increasing unemployment um, or drops in various economic measures like GDP per capita, et cetera, and it is during these economic hardships that uh, voters start to look for alternative uh, political movements to support. And that kind of common sense understanding doesn't really pan out if we start looking across the board. I, it's really, to my mind, after spending some significant time trying to understand the economic dimension, uh, what's become very clear is that it's about the framing of economic issues around cultural um, ideas that's really been driving the mobilization of these political groups. And we can point to a lot of uh, counterpoints to the economic driver theory. Um, I think Austria is a very clear one. Um, Austria is a very wealthy country uh, that ba barely was affected by the 2008 uh, economic crisis in Europe. And yet it's also the country now that has the, a far-right party in a government coalition. Um, we can point to many others, like Sweden, for example, um, other uh, Scandinavian and Northern European countries like Denmark, um, and, and Germany as well, where we have the AFD emerge in 2013, um, certainly not at the peak of the 2008-2008 crisis, again, from which Germany didn't suffer nearly as badly as Greece, Spain, um, Portugal, and Italy. So... On the political side, I think it's important to remember that these parties don't emerge and these movements don't emerge um, in a vacuum, right? There is a broader political context here um, that I think is really key to remember. One, I mentioned earlier that we have seen kind of this proliferation of new parties, right? And that's because there's been this general fragmentation of politics that we've seen happen over the course of the last few decades in Europe. Um, and a failure of the center, and I would say especially the center left, to be able to present an alternative vision for the future. So we've had this bizarre reversal where I think the left, and I'm talking about the center left specifically, um, has become, rather than progressive in its vision, um, I think at least perhaps technocratic to say the least, but certainly not forward-looking. Um, and in some ways the right has become forward-looking. Um, you may, we may not like that vision that they present of a future um, in which you know, countries are defined by ethnic homogeneity, um, in which European borders are once again closed off to um, immigrants, um, you know, but certainly they're presenting some sort of vision that the left has failed to present in the same way. And as a result, the working class... Um, and the, what we could call the traditional constituency of the labor parties, the social democratic parties in Europe, um, since the 1990s, again, long before the economic crisis in 08 and the refugee crisis in 20, 2015, started to shift away from the central left. And increasingly over time, these voters have been shifting to the right. Um, and not to the center right, but to the extreme right. And I don't want to lay all the blame on, on the center left for kind of failing to hold on to their voters or for ha failing to capture some sort of vision and for basically becoming technocrats and protectors of the achievements of welfare state capitalism uh, from the middle of the 20th century. The center right has also struggled to respond in an effective way. And we see this over and over again in the most recent elections in Europe. Um, and I think the two strategies that have been pursued uh, one has been to basically exclude the far right um, from politics altogether. This was a strategy in the early 2000s, and it completely failed uh, because it fed this narrative that these political parties were being kept out of 
uh, politics, that there was some sort of uh, establishment conspiracy to keep them away. They were never given a chance. And that actually fed their narrative of um, kind of challenging the mainstream, being the disruptors, that um, many more people who are dissatisfied in various ways across Europe um, with, with the vision of European integration primarily um, really clung on to. And the other strategy that we see happening now, especially in Austria, but also in the Netherlands, as the far right challenges further and further the mainstream, um, is the center right is in a way trying to copy or co-opt some of the policy ideas of the far right. And this copycat strategy, I think, is also doomed to be a failure in the long term. One, because electorally, this was a study I did with a co-author a few years ago, we were starting to understand, you know, what works, right? Where you see this closure of the issue between the center right and the far right, or where you see kind of a more exclusionary approach where the center right tries to drive a wedge um, between themselves and the, and the far right. And unfortunately, the, both the exclusionary strategy and the copycat strategy electorally, electorally get more wins for the far right. And I think there's a couple of reasons for that that we could speculate on. Um, I think one is that why would you vote for um, the copy when you have the original, right? Um, I think that drives a lot of that. Um, and then, but the counter effect is, of course, these ideas that once considered extremist or fringe now become part of the mainstream when they're being um, given credence to by the centrist parties. And in the long term, you see this kind of strategy work in one-off elections. So we saw this a little bit, I would argue, in the Netherlands with the recent elections where you had the center-right party um, really pick up this rhetoric of anti-immigrant, um, uh, anti-Muslim ideas from the far right. Uh, but and it did help the center right secure its victory in, in, in that case. But over time, what my research with my, my co-author in Europe has shown is that that strategy will inevitably get, lead to electoral gains for the far right anyways. So it might, it might work in the short term, but it's doomed to fail in the long term. There, there's, a, there's a happy middle, I should say. You know, it's not all doom and gloom, but uh, we don't really know what the happy middle is yet. <laughs> Um, so, I think some of the, 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 those are the drivers that I see. I mean, the thinning out of the center, a fragmentation of politics more broadly, and a, the cultural framing of economic issues that the, I think the far right specifically has been very, very good at in the European context. But also, now that we've had decades of these dynamics emerge in Europe, I think we can also talk about the effects. Um, of having these political parties in some capacity um, in, in European parliaments, in European politics, and now, as the case of Italy shows, the governing parties in some major European um, economies and European countries. So I think what we're starting to see is that these parties are contributing not in themselves to a profound change in the, the ideology or the rhetoric or the political climate in a specific country, but what they're producing is a sort of inability of the center of the establishment parties, which still dominate most European countries, with the exception of Italy, perhaps, and Austria, is they're making it very difficult for democracies to deliver. And so what we're entering is this era of weak coalitions, and you see this across the board um, in Germany, uh, where we took months to form a government, in Sweden where it took months to form a government, in various Baltic states where, again, it takes months to form a government because as these parties gain, it becomes more difficult to build uh, majority coalitions. And these weak coalitions are ushering in an era of what I think about as democratic paralysis. And we don't know what the, where we'll land on the other side of that, but I think that answer is relatively clear if we continue on this path, which is that as establishment parties are increasingly more and more incapable of delivering results uh, because they're being so weakened from the challenge from the right specifically, and they're not able to achieve the kinds of economic political changes that their constituencies demand, this is going to feed more and more appetite for parties that are counter-establishment, that are presenting different ideas. Um, and I see a future in which, you know, we that we're going to have a lot more Italys in Europe and far fewer Frances, uh, where, of course, Macron was able to defeat in a really embarrassing way 
uh, the candidacy of Marine Le Pen in the last presidential elections. So I think the other debate that is being had right now when it comes to Europe is whether we actually hit peak populism. Um, Larry and I started talking about this a little bit, and this is a, kind of, I see a headline like this every once in a while. Um, in having looked at the trend lines here, um, I don't think we've had, uh, we've, we've hit a peak populism period yet. Um, I think Italy is, is a really interesting test case. Uh, because right now, uh, Salvini, who's uh, you know, really credited for taking a relatively fringe pol regional political party in Italy, the, the Northern League, as it was once called, now just called the League, um, and making it the leading political force in Europe today. And you can have a debate at this point as to who's the most important politician in Europe. Is it Angela Merkel or is it uh, Salvini? And I think it might be Salvini. Um, so we'll, we'll have to see there's a certain disillusionment that comes from actually having a far-right party as the governing political party um, of a major European economy or not. So far, it seems like um, they're just gaining at the polls, if I'm not mistaken. Larry, you might know this better than I do. Um, and they're not really losing out quite yet. I think the other thing to look at um, is in terms of another data point whether we've hit peak populism or not, is the upcoming European parliamentary elections at the end of May, where the far-right parties are projected to gain not a huge amount, but up to potentially 20% of seats, uh, which would be significant. Uh, but right now, you know, this question of whether there is sort of a nationalist internationalist that's forming in Europe, um, right now the parties have not been able to reach any sort of you know, single faction consensus. And the far right in the European Parliament right now is split into four separate factions. Uh, but just today, just today, there was a rally in Prague uh, by most of the major players. I think Slovenia appeared via video. Um, and then we have Marine Le Pen, leader of the National Assembly, as it's now called. Um, and this was hosted by a Czech uh, politician who uh, is advocating for so-called Czechsit, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, so, and there was a rally just today in Prague and where uh, there was sort of a, a call for to combine forces, to look past the differences, and to unite in a solid faction within the European uh, parliamentary system. I'm still pretty skeptical they'll be able to do that, mainly because once you start getting down to the details, and if uh, we, we reach a point where you ha just have to decide, well, we can all agree that we're against something. We're all against the EU, even though we're all running for parliamentary elections there. Um, but... What are you actually for? And when you get to that question, um, for example, one of Slovenia's main rallying points on the migration front um, has been the insistence that other European countries uh, take more refugees that Italy has been killed with, I mean, I mean uh, or overwhelmed with, I should say, uh, because of their just geographic position. And of course, Poland and Hungary, which both have, uh, you could say, increasingly authoritarian uh, <laughs> and you know, illiberal political parties in power um, are completely against this uh, because it would be a, a political suicide for them to agree to this kind of system. So once you start getting down to the details, I think the potential for a single faction is still relatively low, but we'll see. I think the other uh, data point that I think interesting is the so-called Brexit effect. Um, since Brexit, because it's such an ongoing disaster, um, all of the calls for the, the Dexits, Oxits, and whatever have you, uh, have pretty much died down. Um, and support, pub public support, popular support for the EU is now an all is a peak high from below um, refugee crisis and below uh, 08 uh, economic crisis level. So now the vast majority of publics across Europe see the EU as a good thing. They don't want their countries to leave the European Union. And so now the rallying call has become okay, we're not going to do a Frexit or a Dexit um, or a Chexit, uh, but we're going to transform Europe from the inside. And this is really kind of the agenda of Salvini, who I think sees himself as the new leader of a transformed Europe um, that doesn't look like a Europe that is integrating and opening borders and uh, liberalizing in the way that we think of European integration, but a Europe that's perhaps reestablishing hard borders again and rethinking um, its place in the world in, in different ways. <laughs>
Um, one thing I'll also point out to look at is that Spain is about to hold elections, I believe, this Sunday. And, in, and Spain, interestingly enough, has been a country that has not fit this pattern of having a far-right political party uh, within the parliament. Um, Spain has had overwhelming support uh, for Europe, despite the economic crisis hitting uh, Spain significantly um, about 10 years ago. But now, for the first time since Franco, uh, we have a far-right political party that will likely get about 10% um, in the Spanish parliament called Vox. Um, I don't really understand the name. Uh, but uh, this political party is uh, basically a response to the secessionist movement in Catalonia, um, and it's highly, highly nationalist, and we'll see what the elections actually bring. So I think I'll, I'll just basically stop there, and, and I think my main takeaways is these parties are here to stay. Um, their effects are more about weakening the ability of the center to deliver, and I still remain skeptical on the nationalist internationalist. Thank you. I think we've run a little long, so I, what we're going to do is maybe confine ourselves uh, here on the panel for to about five minutes, and then open up the uh, uh, questions from from uh, the audience. Um, so, I'm sort of curious. You know, both both Elena and 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 Joe talked about, and 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 Ben talked about these antecedents and uh, almost you know the that that what we're seeing today was fleshed out in its thinking and so forth you know without the numbers some time ago and then um and the the period which seems most significant in in the things that you said is the 90s I'm wondering what you know, and I'm, I'm sitting here thinking, okay, what the hell happened then? <laughs> and it was it was the end of the Cold War. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if, in your analyses, where you think that might have been uh, uh, an effect or a profound effect. Anybody? I'll I'll start. Um, yeah, I actually think that it's, it's the end of the Cold War, at least in the U.S. context, which is the one I know best, obviously, um, is absolutely crucial. There's a great piece by uh, a law scholar at Cornell named Aziz Rana who makes an argument that partly the, the ideological center that was held together in the, broadly across the 20th century in the U.S. Um, kept Republicans and Democrats, liberals and conservatives, in opposition to the totalitarian other of the Soviet Union. And so uh, liberalism was bounded uh, on its left and conservatism was bounded on its right uh, um, by, this, by this consensus, this mid-century consensus. But after the uh, end of the Cold War, this opens up the possibility of new political identifications and the broadening out of... Um, of, of politics no longer policed by these uh, boundaries of a consensus. And his argument is that, there, that this then, this era looks more like, you know, the 1920s in some way or the early 20, the beginning of the 20th century, uh, and that the right kind of discovered the possibilities, these new openings of how you could push things rightward uh, before the left did. But you, I think you can see it in the U.S. party system now that there's, you know, it's, it's, um, socialism or social democracy are no longer epithets. They can be, I mean, I'm not sure that they're accurately descriptive in talking about, you know, people like Sanders, and they certainly weren't talking when they're talking about Obama, but, um, I, you know, I, I think there's a possibility for um, things moving leftward and rightward in new ways um, that are a, definitely a post-Cold War um, phenomenon. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. I also think that... Um, you know, I feel like the buddy-duddy historian of the room, but I also think that actually, I mean, the 90s to me is surprising more in terms of what doesn't happen, right? What the end of the Cold War doesn't signify what we sort of think it should because there are these antecedents long before that, right? And to return to something that, um, that I think everyone brought up, right, the notion of ideas and people moving from the fringe to the center is what I think is important that's happening before that, right? Laying the groundwork for ideas that seemed extreme to be, you know, just tradable in an open political 
you know, in a, a centrist political discourse, I think is what people are working on in the United States and in Brazil long before the 90s, right? Um, I mean, the United States, the person that comes to mind is Carl McIntyre, right, who's this, like, firebrand, right, whose ideas, when you read them, sound extreme, right, but who laid the groundwork for an evangelical right that was going to come into its own in the 80s, really. And so instead of the end of the Cold War signifying, you know, a sort of a, maybe a move back from extreme anti-communism and making space for more social democratic policies, I mean, we get to Clinton and it's too late, mm. right? We get to Fernando Henrique Cardoso and it's too late, right? I mean, these are people who, to come back to, I think, Alina's very astute point, right, are sort of embodying this way in which the center left is destined to fail because of its its capitulation in the 90s to a politics that is neoliberal, right, yeah. that is you know, that is not going to deliver on any of the kinds of redistributive discourse that is at least retained at that point. Um, so I think, it, for me at least, it's before the 90s, really, that this, mm -hmm. the, the key sort of fringe to center um, movement is happening that means that the whole framework has shifted to the right, and thus the possibilities are already foreclosed upon. What I find really interesting about the 1990s in Europe is that actually the 1990s, looking back, is like this moment of overwhelming <laughs> euphoria, right? Because the fall of the Iron Curtain, you have all of these Central Eastern European countries um, that will form the part of the Warsaw Pact and the Eastern Bloc. You're now integrating, liberalizing, becoming part of uh, the West, right? Um, reforming their institutions is, is the third wave of democratization, right, is really ushered in by all of these countries becoming democracies. Um, and so looking back on you, 1989 is this beautiful moment, right? Um, and But at the same time, what we're getting in the 1990s, it, are these conversations don't, don't pan out in some ways um, about the, the East, so-called East, kind of being backwards. And there are all of these fears that without you know, the heavy hand of the Soviet Union, suddenly we're going to see these um, nationalist, violent, um, tribal-like movements emerge Central Eastern Europe, and that doesn't happen at all. But what does happen, as borders liberalize, as these countries join the EU, as uh, we have Sch the Schengen Zone emerge and then uh, the Eurozone emerge, um, is that we see these political parties and these political movements actually emerge in the West, not in the East. And so if we're thinking about, you know, who did what, when, why, and who was there first, um, <laughs> You know, I see a very clear kind of import of the Western European model of nationalist populism towards the East. Um, and now you have, you know, like Fidesz in Hungary um, is a prime example of this, um, really using the template established by the National Front of how do you mainstream your ideas? How do you take the fringe to the mainstream, as we're all talking about? But that model is established in the West, right, first and foremost. And in many ways, initially, the anti-immigrant rhetoric is not against uh, Muslim minorities. Um, it's against, you know, your, uh, the Polish plumber, right, um, coming and invading uh, your country, right? And that, a lot of that rhetoric was still present in the Brexit vote, too, um, very, very recently. So I think it's very interesting to see how these ideas and these models um, move from unex in unexpected ways. And I think it was interesting that I think, Larry, maybe you said that um, in Europe, uh, the, the alt-right um, is an import from the United States. But I see it the other way. I mean, if we've been looking at trends in, in Europe, and at least the trends in who's voting for these political parties, obviously the political system is very different, the parliamentary system is different, um, but I see the same trends happening with the election of Donald Trump, because if you looked at the Republican primary, I'll just say this, and you looked at who voted um, just in the Republican primary, and the constituency that voted for Trump in the primary looks very, very similar the demographics of the constituents that were voting for the far right um, in Europe for a very long time. Okay, we're going to uh, open this up to the floor. So um, whoever's walking around with um, microphones, make a choice. 
<laughs> okay, um, I have a question, particularly on the American and the Latin American case. One of the things that seems to me that was missing, and I'd like to hear what your response would be, is that um, we talked about all the vehicles that you could communicate with in terms of, of, of the right, uh, in terms of the Internet. But what seems to be missing to me is the role of the Catholic Church, which you have plenty of pictures on, which is a legitimate source, which has direct communications with almost all kinds of its agents. And then even in a historical context, I mean, John Paul II starts a lot of this stuff that you've all been discussing, including the issues on sexuality and, and communism and what's required. And we get another version of this, with Benedict more recently. So I wonder about an institution like this, which is a government that has its own sources and is actually aiding uh, a particular kind of, of source. I'd like your response. Okay. Another question? Yes. Um, this is sort of additive, but not about religion. Uh, you've alluded to neoliberal politics but you really haven't talked about the whole phenomenon of globalization mm -hmm. and what that has done to working class populations in both the United States and across Europe. Um, and of course the whole phenomenon of Reagan and Thatcher introducing these dramatically right wing conceptions of how uh, society should function that then gets picked up throughout Europe uh, to wind up in a place in the last few years where Angela Merkel is seen as a hero when she's in fact a right-wing political party in Europe is ultimately a testament to how far these conceptions of right-wing economics and politics have driven uh, both Western Europe and the United States and across the developed world. And the other piece I think that you're leaving out is the subsequent psychologies that emerge among working class populations uh, who feel like they've lost their future. Uh, I happen to be a psychiatrist, and I know about that phenomenon of what happens to people who lose their jobs, or who fear they're gonna lose their jobs, or who don't see a future. Because now you have precarity across all developed economies. Nobody has job security anymore, and I can talk for hours about what that means. Um, yeah, so I, I just want to jump in quickly on uh, Ben's kind of uh, Brazilian exceptionalism to kind of make a, a Brazilian exceptionalist provocation and uh, kind of continue in that vein and make a Brazilian exceptionalist provocation. And just say quickly that it is a provocation and a question. I don't have the answer to this. I, I'm, not, I'm not actually a scholar of the right wing. I'm a political anthropologist specializing in Brazil, which has unfortunately led me to this sad place and, and topic. Uh, yeah. But it's not what I intended to study. So, um, but the, the provocation is this, it, it's about the adequacy of kind of nationalist international as this unifying mm -hmm. frame. And particularly in the Brazilian case, there's a really kind of peculiar and ambiguous relationship to nationalism of, you know, the Bolsonaro movement. On the one hand, you have the slogan, Brazil above all, you know, this very kind of fascist sounding national slogan. On the other hand, you have this you know, nationalism, at least in the 20th century in Latin America, was much more associated with the political left than the political right. And that's because it tended to have an anti-imperialist, that is anti-US and, and developmentalist uh, kind of uh, perspective. And the, the kind of current right in Brazil tends to be, you know, it adopts a kind of position of, of subservience to the United States, uh, tends to um, be willing to kind of give up industries developed with, you know, kind of nationalist economic policy throughout the 20th century, um, and, and, you know, very much willing to kind of insert Brazil into a kind of Monroe Doctrine order. So there's, you know, it's, it's something about nationalism which kind of imagines these, um, you know, equivalent national groups and doesn't necessarily capture the, the relations of, of inequality across this, this new right at, at, you know, these different national levels. So that's provocation and a question. Great. Yeah, I think we should stop there. Um, let, let me address uh, your point. Um, you know, that um, when I say nationalist international, it's obviously a, 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 an umbrella. And all of these, all of these uh, uh, 
instances have unique qualities. And Bolsonaro, it seems to me to stand out for it, which is to say all of these leaders evoke a kind of nostalgia for a golden age um, in, in all, of all of these uh, uh, movements of, of, of nationalism. And Bolsonaro is unique in that his evocation is of military dictatorship. N none of the uh, you know, nobody we're talking about in Europe is 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 talking about the good old days of of military dictatorship, and I think, you know, perhaps that's that's rooted in the uh, Brazilian tradition or even Latin American tradition. But I, I think it's it is a kind of difference that 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 you find in these matters. And one other thing. Um, you, Donnie pointed out Reagan and Thatcher, and um, it seems to me, um, uh, and, and Ben talked about uh, uh, how these things emerged before the, um, the, the end of the Cold War, and, and Ben referred to essentially liberal and left uh, first... Um, uh, lack of new ideas, which which uh, Elena also talked about, but but their their um, uh, collaboration in emerging um, uh, neoliberalism, mm -hmm. and I think there actually is a kind of of marker out there of of uh, the turning point of that, which was Francois Mitterrand sure. in in about 1982 who um, finally got elected as the socialist president of, yeah. of, of France on a socialist platform and once in office, flipped on a dime and, 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 and became, and became um, the first great uh, French neoliberal. I mean, not to bring it back to Latin America, but um, we could argue that the PRI in Mexico, right, in, with its, you know, highly neoliberal policies before that, right, is, an, you know, a revolutionary party that has already capitulated to that. Obviously, imperialism mitigates that, but I think it's important. I mean, to come to, back to Sean's point, I mean, I think, I also think, you know, I love the, the nationalist international term as a, um, like a jumping off point. But I, yeah, I think there is something we need to talk about, which is like, what is the nature of this new nationalism? I mean, something that strikes me is, you know, just anecdotally, all of the Brazilians who fall on one side or another side of like, whether or not you can paint your face in Brazilian colors anymore, or you can wear the Brazilian colors on a jacket anymore, because that kind of nationalism is now associated with Bolsonaro, right? All these Brazilians in San Diego are like, I wish I could wear my jersey, but it makes it seem like I'm supporting Bolsonaro. Right, um, so it's certainly like an aesthetic nationalism at the very least, right? Um, even if it doesn't then sort of extend to actual policies, which of course it doesn't in the case of the visas and these sort of like overtly Monroe Doctrine policies that have been adopted by Bolsonaro, but that could also be said of the US, right? I mean like if Trump represents the vindication of a certain kind of aesthetic nationalism that like likes to put Confederate flags on its bumpers, I mean, you know, that's also a nationalism that does not care about Russian interference in elections, right? And like takes a very selective view of national security. So, I mean, I, there, you know, I don't know that that to me that doesn't dismiss the 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 um, usefulness of nationalism in the category. It's just like what is actually contained in that nationalism. I just wanted to respond to one of the folks who brought up the issue about globalization. You know, in the 1990s, when you were studying these kinds of movements, whether in Europe and the United States, the big boogeyman after the fall of the wall really was globalization, right? Neoliberal politics. And in some ways, I think one of the first things I wrote at the center in 1999 was globalization being used in the same conspiratorial way that anti-Semitic theories were being used, right? It was this multicultural, border-breaking something of elites coming in to uh, ruin everything, and that and that those ideas eventually morphed, at least in terms of the kinds of things I track, into more racialized anti-immigrant thinking as, as the boogeyman. So it's, a, it's an important point. Uh, I also think, you know, the one thing about the fall of the wall, which was obviously seminal, there's another thing that happened right at that time is that was 40 years after the end of World War II. 
So it's the lifespan within which somebody could have experienced the war, seen the horrors of the war, and been worried about nationalism because they were rooted in that experience. And by the time the 90s came, it was, it's essentially secondhand at that point. And so people have forgot, you know, slowly forgot the horrors of what happened. And there were all these people you guys have been talking about who were rewriting that history mm. in the 50s, in the 60s, in the 70s, right, to make it seem less serious what happened. And I think that that's just like a very important factor when you think about how these movements have been able to rise in the last 20, 25 years. And just a quick comment to follow up this uh, on the European side about globalization. I mean, I think certainly, um, you know, we started this um, conversation, I think, with a quote from Marx. If I'm not mistaken, this is also a quote from Marx. Um, you know, this notion that all that is solid melting into air, right? Mm -hmm. This idea of um, your communities uh, changing so rapidly, whether that's real or perceived, it actually doesn't matter um, because you know, we also know that it's actually in areas, well, it's hard to get good data on this um, for Europe as a whole, but we have some good in indicators for individual country cases. When areas we have the most homogenous white communities, um, it, that is actually where you get the most support for anti-immigrant political parties. And again, it is because of this, not the reality of the experience of immigrants taking your jobs, um, it is because of the, per the, the perceived fear of that, right? And it is this framing and channeling of these kinds of fears that I think has proven to be so effective because it is happening in the context of very rapid economic and political change across the European continent. So after studying all this for a long time and trying to understand where the economic and political drivers have actually come down to, is like, this is really all about culture at the end of the day. And the sense of cultural loss um, that many people are feeling, even if it's not being reflected in reality, it's certainly being reflected them in their social media groups, um, in their digital worlds, right, they used to not exist, where those ideas that used to be fringe now seem to dominate and now seem to be legitimate and credible um, because you're living in this highly curated uh, digital environment. Yeah. With that... Um, um, I don't think we answered Martin's questions about the church. I'm sorry? The church. The church. You're on. Great. <laughs> Uh, well, I mean, so I, um, I agree that the Catholic Church is a, a really important part of this story, both transnationally and in national contexts. Um, I think that maybe the problem with making a broad conclusion about it is that it sort of plays both roles, right? I mean, the Church creates a forum in which both um, the forces that are going to sort of contribute to Christian and religious neoconservatism can sort of come together and find each other and also creates other kinds of forums that mitigate against that, right? So um, the Second Vatican Council, for example, both provides this moment when Catholic conservatives see each other across national, right? They're like, oh, you're another person who doesn't like the new mass. Awesome, <laughs> right? But they're facing repression from the institutional church, right? So it does sort of create communicatory networks. On the other hand, those are complicated by the institutional nature of the church. Um, I will say that Brazilian Catholics were among the pioneers of people who were creating those linkages in terms of traditionalism itself. But on the other hand, obviously, also Brazilian Catholics were, among the, were at the forefront of progressive Catholics at the council and thereafter sort of championing liberation theology. Um, so I don't think there's like a simple answer to the role that the church plays. Pardon me? Let's have some questions from women now. Well, you know, we, we, we are having a, uh, a reception upstairs, and um, it's time we got there. And, and I'm sure we will all make ourselves available to questions from women. <laughs> 